Hey there, this is Bram Kanstein and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. Together with my guests on this podcast, I go on a journey to discover how our current financial system works, why it's flawed and why Bitcoin is the most relevant technology that you, my fellow millennials, should understand and adopt. In this episode, I'm joined by Daniel Batten. He's a climate tech investor, author and business educator from New Zealand. He has a passion for sustainable development and entrepreneurship and spent 10 years training tech CEOs. His interest in climate tech led him to discover the potential of Bitcoin as a tool to combat climate change. He's elaborated a lot of this in his writings and activities, counteracting mainstream beliefs and cementing his place as a visionary in the field. His book, How to Change the World with One Pitch, pitch contains a blueprint that he now uses to effectively orange build people on Bitcoin. I'm super excited to talk to him today. Welcome, man. Thank you. It's great to be on here. Appreciate the intro. Yeah, and uh, thanks so much for coming on. I uh, uh, My goal with this podcast is actually to talk to the people that taught me a lot already on you know the the internet and uh, and you're one of them man i i absolutely love how uh, how you dove into the climate aspect of bitcoin and uh, probably and i think we'll talk about it you were you were on the other side before but you saw the light so i think it's a fascinating personal journey as well to uh, to talk about so uh, yeah really happy you're here man fantastic happy to be here so on your on your LinkedIn, I saw something that really interests me. It said, you said, what really matters is meditation and knowledge. The West has made a major contribution to minor things, but ancient wisdom and meditation can make us happy people who change the world for the better, just as one flame can light many lights. What, what are your thoughts behind that? You know, it may not strike you as a natural synergy with Bitcoin, uh, but I found it absolutely is. If you're going to write about Bitcoin and how it's a positive force for fighting climate change, then you better be ready for, number one, being criticized by people within the Bitcoin ecosystem who say that climate science is a sham. And number two, being criticized by people outside the Bitcoin ecosystem who say that the idea <laughs> that Bitcoin can do anything positive for the climate is heresy. So. Yeah. Uh, being comfortable with having people call you an idiot on a regular basis, uh, unless you just have this supremely natural um, glow of uh, maybe having been brought up in a really well-loved environment for many years and just having great natural resilience, uh, w which I didn't have the benefit of, then you've got to look for other ways to build that resilience. Uh, and I think a lot of people will avoid situations where they're going to be criticized on a regular basis. Mm. And that's a shame because it stops you growing. It stops you leaning in and it stops you making a contribution. Uh, and the other alternative is you, you toughen up. And there's different ways to do it. Some people do it by counterpunching. Uh, but my technique is just, it, honestly, meditation has been the way where I can see beyond my instant reaction, which is still there, uh, but yeah. these days I have a bit more impulse control. Uh, I can see the person where they're coming from, their perspective. So it's just been an incredibly invaluable tool for me. And I think as well on my Bitcoin journey, sometimes when I th thought in the early days I was going crazy when my intellect was telling me that Bitcoin was net positive for the environment. And I was just looking at the data and saying, no, this cannot be true. But the the intuition was saying, keep going, keep going. You're onto yeah. something here. Yeah. Um, even though everyone is telling you you're a fool and an idiot and you're crazy and you're greenwashing, you're onto something. Keep going. And, yeah. and for me, meditation really helped me to trust. Everyone has an intuition, but it helped me to trust it more. Hmm. Yeah, I, I love what you just said. I feel, and, and I've talked with a lot of people on this podcast actually about the same thing. Like with Bitcoin, it's not only a knowledge thing. Like you, there's lots of dimensions that you can learn about, but this personal journey that's intertwined with that is just as important right as you said like um and, and i have exact the same experience right you think in a rational way through a certain dimension of bitcoin and you end up at a certain place with a certain realization and you think no this this cannot be true it cannot be this big right like you mm -hmm. like the further you zoom out with the you know and and uh, like the what the effect that it could have and the implications and so then your ego starts talking, right? 
like, no, you're probably wrong, or this is like, you're crazy or, or something like that. Right. And as you just explained it, and also I think how I see it, like this meditation helps you keep, keep you grounded. Right. And also, um, understand oh, keep, keeps that. Keeps the ego in check. The ego yeah, can be exactly. in, yeah. in the positive or the negative. Like you say, ego doesn't mean yeah. you think you're full of it. Ego can mean you go into self doubt. That's also ego. Yes. And it's a protection so, also, yeah, right? It, correct. Yeah. 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 So, be so that again, transcending that, getting past that and coming back to what is truth rather than what's convenient for my ego to believe is important. Exactly. Yes. And look, there's times when I've, I've wished it was like, oh, really? Is Bitcoin that good for the environment? That really sucks because now when I state the facts, I'm going to be called an idiot by a lot more people than if it wasn't as good. But yeah. again, that's ego, right? Uh, and, and part of the ego was like, well, maybe you should just tone it down a little bit. I had this moment when I was giving this uh, keynote speech in Lugano, and I had the decision about the title. Uh, so contender A was Bitcoin is one of the world's best ESG assets. Okay. Contender B was Bitcoin is the world's best ESG asset. And I wanted to give it the first title because it was a little bit safer. Uh, yes. I didn't risk being called an idiot by quite as many people. Uh, but when I was looking at the data, I was like, no, the most accurate description of this talk is actually to use title B. Because what the data is telling me is it's not one of the best, it's the best. And so if I underplay it, I'm going against the principles of my own book, which is that I'm being disingenuous because to understate is just as disingenuous as to overstate something because we do it for the same reasons. Yeah. Uh, because we want, we want to gain something for ourselves and we want to avoid some pain for ourselves. Mm. And that's never a good reason. So you got to tell the truth. Yeah, it's like intellectually dishonest either way right Correct. It's yeah either against uh, uh, yourself yeah. or or to the benefit of the subject that that you're talking about and i'm a kiwi i'm a new zealander so we have this habit of understanding everything and as a culture and that's something that i've challenged a lot because it's resulted in new zealand having this on one hand this incredible mentality for innovation and technology but on the other hand never really realizing the fruits of that commercially because we undersell ourselves so much and giving away technology for a song or selling equity in companies for a song. And that's what I've coached a lot of CEOs of New Zealand companies is actually to be more confident in how they deliver what they have. Uh, and mm. because it's something that I recognize in myself and that I've had to fight against because the fear of being perceived as getting too big for your boots is huge. We have this thing called tall, tall poppy syndrome, which is prevalent in this culture where it's like you rise up too high, you get shot down. And you learn that from right early on in school. Uh, being ahead of the crowd, above the crowd is not appreciated. So fitting in, being in the middle of the pack is everything. And so you're fighting against some really entrenched cultural patterns of behavior there. Yeah. I wonder if there's like other subjects besides Bitcoin that could actually challenge you in a personal way to to transcend that, right? Like what you just said, I, I, again, I have the same experience, right? Like I know myself and then I'm an investigative, rational, hopefully honest person, right? And sometimes with whatever subjects that I researched in the past, right? You get to certain points where you think like, okay, this is now my understanding and thus my belief, right? But you still doubt yourself for whatever reason. Yeah, maybe it's culture or you're a bit insecure or there's something with your ego, right? But with Bitcoin, I know, and I see that with you too, like I know yeah. that I know, right? Uh, and uh, so without question, there's, there's, there's some point at yeah. which you, you just know. And it's yeah. the point at which, for me, it took about two months. And there was a lot of questioning during that time and what I went through, I went through this process. So I liken it to a due diligence process on a company. And I said, okay, if I was going to do due diligence on technology, that's what I should do on Bitcoin. So I looked at it objectively and due diligence means you don't believe anyone. Yeah. You believe data and you know, need to know the right data and you need to know when someone's bullshitting you. And so by asking the questions, uh, yeah, by asking the I've questions, had the same role. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, it turns out being an investor in a technology company is a really good qualification 
to deciding whether Bitcoin has good ESG credentials or not, because you get very good at uh, being skeptical of everyone, the, the pro-Bitcoin yes. and the anti-Bitcoin uh, perspective. And I was to start with, so I was very skeptical when anyone from the Bitcoin ecosystem told me it's good for the environment. I was skeptical. But I was also equally skeptical when someone who was against Bitcoin told me that it was bad for the environment. Uh, and so with that skepticism, I just inquired into, and, and so the only thing that was going to change my perspective from skepticism, universal skepticism, was a sound logic, good data, contemporary data, representative data, and, um, a, and using apples for apples comparisons, and also having a sense of longevity. So by that, I mean... Uh, I knew enough from looking at climate tech that simply statements like technology X is bad for the environment or has harmful environment effects, uh, that's a nonsense statement because it's every, empty. every technology yes. is bad for the environment. Every technology yes. harms the environment. Solar harms the environment. Wind harms the environment. Um, carbon sequestration harms the environment. It causes much more carbon to go into the air than it takes out. But we, we persevere with these technologies because we believe that at some point there'll be a tipping point and the scales will change and it'll become net positive. And so I started to look at the rubric of you have to give a technology a certain amount of grace period to prove itself, but you also have to look at the trajectory to see that it's not just greenwashing. Um, so I looked at all those factors. And what I found universally was that the arguments against Bitcoin uh, used old data, they used non-representative data, and they used bad data. They used metrics which were either made up or not meaningful or lacked context. And they made statements which lacked context, such as, uh, for example, Bitcoin is powered mostly by fossil fuels. That's true, but the context is so does every technology in the world that uses the grid. <laughs> Because that's not actually measuring the emissions of Bitcoin, it's measuring the emissions of the underlying network. So there was mm -hmm. a lot of decontextualized information that relied on populations not having a good understanding of that context. And the only, the only reason you ever do that, it's, it's typically not an innocent mistake. It's typically because you have gone out of your way to try to malign something yes. Yes. Um, to make it look worse than it is. So I found a lot of that uh, on the anti-Bitcoin side. And then I went to the pro-Bitcoin side, and I expected to see just as much um, spin and subterfuge and, and all those techniques. Um, so I went in skeptical. I heard statements like, it's good for the grid. It builds out the grid. I said, how? How much? Show me. And, and there wasn't a lot of evidence. Uh, that, there was some evidence, but it could, wasn't quantified well. So I said, well, well that's good, but let, let's investigate it. And I kept on investigating. I said, well, look, it does have potential. You're right, but it hasn't been quantified. And that's not an argument against it. It just means that you can't make that claim with any uh, force until you've done some quantification. And so I started to ask, okay, let's start to quantify. I got curious and I said, well, what have I quantified? It doesn't look like it's that hard. This could be quantified. Uh, and I started to, and the more I quantified, I thought, holy crap, this, is a, this actually could be really, really good. And I looked at things such as its capacity to um, accelerate renewable transition, uh, its capacity to make renewable operations more profitable, uh, the amount of re emission reduction that it could cause to a, just generally on a grid. Uh, and then I got fascinated, as you know, with the whole methane mitigation question. And one of the reasons I got fascinated with this is it's just so easy to measure. You can measure directly if you're using a power source, which is methane going into the air, and you stop that going into an air and you pipe it into a generator instead with a bit of purification first so it doesn't mess up the generator and then so that could be coming from a landfill or a farm or wastewater facility or an oil field which has a, have a flare stack or is even venting it worse and you put it into a generator you can measure exactly how many emissions would have gone into the environment which are now not going into the environment which have been used for bitcoin mining and I started to get really, really fascinated by that. And I thought, you know what? This is actually, not only is this, let's be really clear. Right now, it's not negative. It's not net positive for the environment. Or we can't say that it is. But the important thing is that it actually is trending in that direction. And there's no yeah. question 
So it's a little bit like where solar was in nineteen in the early nineteen nineties, where solar had this massive carbon debt for a long time because it uses coal furnaces to melt the silicon at fourteen hundred and fourteen degrees, huge so, um, carbon debt, and it didn't pay it off until the two thousand and tens, around two thousand and eighteen, I believe it was. So that's a long time. It was invented in the nineteen fifties. That's seventy years almost uh, that it's taken sixty something years to pay off its carbon debt. Bitcoin's going to do it in less than half the time on its current trajectory, which, which is massive, and it's just going to keep on going and going and going. And, it, and again, yes, it has e-waste issues. But again, every technology has e-waste issues. My old Macintosh that I've thrown out has an e-waste waste issue, and I tried to use it for as long as I possibly could. Um, solar has an e-waste issue, and it's much harder to dispose of them than it is of Bitcoin mining. So again, you have to look at these things in context. You have to do yep. apples for apples comparisons, and you have to look at the long-term trajectory of a technology. And simple stuff, like if you're measuring the health of a business, and you're an auditor, and you come back and you say, this business is in terrible shape. And someone says, how do you know that? He said, well, I looked at its expenses and they're off the charts. And they said, well, what about its <laughs> revenue? He said, oh, I didn't measure that. And they'd, they'd fire you because that's gross incompetence. Yeah. And yet it's seen as perfectly acceptable that someone should go in and evaluate a technology and only look at the expense line, i.e. the negative environmental externalities, and say this technology is terrible. And then if someone says, what about its positive and environmental technologies. Oh, come on. It doesn't have any. Don't be ridiculous. That's greenwash. You yeah. fire the person. You say, no, you're not being objective. You have to look at both. You have to objectively assess both. And only when you've done that are you in a position to make any sensible statement about the net benefit of this technology. And then yeah. it's only at a point in time you have to look at trajectory. How is it tracking through time? Is it getting worse? Is it the same? Is it better? And none of this analysis was occurring. And so what I wanted to do is introduce some of the rigor that someone who was evaluating climate technology would apply to Bitcoin. And once you do that, you get a completely different picture. And it's very much that it has the potential to be net positive. And even today, you can say that across six different metrics, it's become the number one ESG asset in the world, which is phenomenal. Yeah, and fascinating. to the ego. <laughs> yeah, there's so much to unpack here. Like I, I've been on your side as well, like on the investor side, I've seen hundreds of thousands of thousands of, of pitches, decks, all that stuff. And I love what you said about that. All those decks, you know, all the graphs go up and to the right, you know? Of course. And pitching an investor like that moment for an entrepreneur I always view it as like, I am a, a, I am at a baseline. I'm at zero. I have no yeah. expectations. I didn't prep. You decide what you tell me, right? This is your moment. So you decide what's in the deck and what, what, what the graphs represent and all these things, right? And you're the expert telling me why this is a good business, right? So you're like um, positively critical. Your stance is like, okay, well, sh show me, right? But then if I am the base layer zero and I can shoot holes in your story, then that is already a big signal that you don't know what you're talking about, right? Or your outset, so just like you said, like the, the outset is flawed, right? Like, oh, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll try to convince Daniel to give me money by telling this, um, you know, unsubstantiated yeah, if, if your methodology story, is fundamentally flawed, it's, you're going you're gonna to see it like that. Um, exactly, if, right. If yeah. you, so that's why if you... If you tell me Bitcoin is using mostly fossil fuel, I'm not going to go, oh, okay. I'm going to go, yeah. pr prove it. Show me the data. Where did that yeah. data come from? How do you know it's accurate? What date did you gather the data? How do you know that yeah. the jurisdictions you got it from are accurate? And show me your methodology. I'm going to look straight for the, the, the section and the methodology which says limitations. Uh, and so that's what mm -hmm. I did with the Cambridge yeah. model. I mean, it's like, okay, step one, look at the statistics. Step two, go to the limitation sections of the model. That's what I'll do with any model, whether it's positive or negative. Yeah. And then read and then the it limitation. Said, uh, 2017 or something, right? The, the data, and then it yeah. said, and then there are two key bits of information there. It said, well, I'm paraphrasing here, but basically we haven't updated our mining map since January the 1st, 2021. Okay. And I kind of put a mental note. Uh, and I had a question, which is, is Bitcoin mining a dynamic system 
like changes in political opinions, such that being one year out of date really matters. And I had that question because it was only that was about a year ago when I first discovered that. Yeah. Um, or is it so stable that it doesn't matter? Because that, that's a that's a flaw, but it's not necessarily a meaningful flaw. So you have to be you have to be kind as well. You can't be too critical because uh, all models have flaws, including my own models. Uh, and then the second thing which intrigued me was it said we don't include off-grid mining. So then I had a second question. I thought, okay, is that a meaningful omission? I said, well, to, in order for it to be meaningful, two things would have to be true. There would have to be a lot of off-grid mining, and it would need to be heavily weighted uh, in a way which is different to on-grid mining. Either it uses a lot more fossil fuel or a lot less compared to on-grid. So then I went out of my way to say, oh, well, let's measure that. Stupid idea. Six months later, <laughs> spending way too long at it. Finally, I had you know the first signs of that data, uh, and, and it was by no means complete. And it, it's still it's taken about a year and a half, and it's still not complete because no one knows how many off grid miners there are. Uh, but the interesting thing is that of the off grid mining we do know about, which it's it's thirty percent of the entire network, and that's a minimum. Remember, because uh, it could be much higher. And in fact, we know mm -hmm. that it's probably higher because there's there's a disparity between if you model and you total up the hash rate and you look at the actual hash rate, there's a gap. And those people are almost certainly off-grid mining somewhere. We just yep. don't know where. Uh, but what we do know is we know the mix of those known off-grid miners is 75% weighted towards sustainable electricity use. 75%. The on-grid miners are using 45% sustainable electricity. So if you have a model which excludes 30% of your population who are using 75% versus 45% of a fuel mix, that's going to make a massive difference to the yes. overall statistic. And it does. It's a difference between the Cambridge model, if it was up to date, should say 45% if it was assuming all mining was happening on grid. But if you factor an off-grid as well, it brings it up to 54%. Now, is that significant? Well, it's very significant because all the news outlets, uh, the EU Commission, Greenpeace, environmental organizations, uh, environmentalists around the world, lobbyists, all rely on that Cambridge data. And that Cambridge data is telling us that most of Bitcoin's fuel use is fossil fuel. Whereas we know, because of model limitations, that it's highly likely that Bitcoin is using at least 54% sustainable electricity, and that's due to meaningful exclusions from the model. The analogy that I use, it's imagine if you wanted to predict the result of an election, and Cambridge, is, Cambridge will say, well, the reason we don't include off-grid is it's really hard to gather that data, which is true if you're an academic. If you're an academic and you're used to gathering data by doing the, the, the methods that academics use, right, which is uh, inquiring existing literature and building models, but not doing field research, not talking to actual yeah. miners, not engaging with communities for the most part, uh, then yes, it's going to be extremely hard to get that data. So you have to actually talk to people. You have to actually mix with people who are Bitcoin miners. And that's not called compromising your objectivity. That's called gathering data. That's called doing field research. So you have to augment a, a theoretical model with a field research-based approach. And only then you get a hybrid model, which builds up into something meaningful. Now, I went into the weeds in that because the consequences of this are enormous. The consequence of getting that data wrong could mean that the EU Commission could decide to ban Bitcoin mining in Europe, or at least... Uh, conclude that Bitcoin mining is bad for the environment, which in turn triggers a domino effect, which eventually leads to an outright ban in Europe, all based on some fundamental flaws in a model, which are stated on the Cambridge website, but what's not stated is the impact of those exclusions, because they themselves don't know, because they haven't done that field research. So, so that's an example of just where I'm going to get into the weeds. I'm going to, um, you know, Query some sacred cows. It's not about whether data is convenient to gather or whether it happens to correspond with the, the, the methods of data gathering that you're familiar with and comfortable with. That's got nothing to do with it. 
if you're going to predict the result of an election, you can't just say, hey, it's inconvenient to survey rural voters. So we're only going to do a, a survey yeah. of, of, of uh, urban voters. And then you come up with some results and some people say, well, you didn't survey rural voters. We know they're going to be more conservative. So of course, this is going to be look more liberal than it actually is. And then you get the actual but election. That, and, huh? Yeah. But is that clumsiness and, or is that on purpose? Like what, it, what are your thoughts there? Nothing because to do with it, clumsiness. It, it is, it's to do with... It's to do with um, it's to do with the fact that it's hard if you're an academic to do field research. It's really hard. But it's also a choice to not add a big disclaimer on the front page of your report. That's actually my major you... criticism. So I think yeah. you know Cambridge deserve credit for being transparent about their model limitations. However, they deserve criticism by not making that the headline. Exactly, yeah. Um, and there should be a huge disclaimer. Uh, their, their defense is to say, we have to start somewhere – but the problem is by starting somewhere, everyone looks at the Cambridge, and they know this, they, they look at the yeah. Cambridge model, they look at the Cambridge brand, and they go, oh, Cambridge, I must be right. And then yeah. they look at Bitcoin Mining Council and they say, well, that's an industry body, that must be wrong. And then they yeah. look at this guy, Daniel Bell, and they say, who's he? It's not even peer result. He's just some Bitcoin maxi. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, but that's what yeah. it looks like to the outside because I'm so favorably disposed towards Bitcoin. But that's not because I... Um, yeah, one, bought two. a whole lot of Bitcoin yeah. in the early days and then yeah. didn't, had some self-fulfilling prophecies I wanted to fulfill mm. and make out it was good, yeah. which is what a lot of environmentalists assume. It was because I actually I, I had no interest in Bitcoin at all. And I got interested in Bitcoin mining before I got interested in Bitcoin. That came second. I had no interest in Bitcoin. Um, I had some theoretical interest, but, but it was like maybe, you know, 20th down on a list of things that I was interested in. Yeah. Uh, so, so there was a very different standpoint that I came to understand it. So, so the, the issue with Cambridge here is that it's not enough to put it in the small print when you know that people are depending upon your brand and your reputation to make far-reaching intergenerational decisions around mining policy. You should have this massive disclaimer that say, this number here is likely to be understating sustainable energy use because it excludes off-grid mining and we haven't brought the model up to date until such time as we've added these things in this figure is no longer trustworthy yeah that would be true transparency and isn't this also like a clash of like old and new world in a sense uh, i have to also think about what we saw yesterday with the etf uh, launch where certain banks don't allow their customers to buy it because it doesn't align etc like th this goes back to i almost almost want to say the beginning of our conversation about this ego or not being aware of of yourself and how you feel or how you like um operate i almost want to say right because when you do research and you end up with a conclusion that you are uncomfortable with that doesn't mean that the conclusion is not right you know and so as you just mentioned cambridge doesn't give this disclaimer they know they have you know a certain um power in the world with sharing their knowledge right and so it's kind of it it is disingenuous in a way because they know you know what their method was and and they decide not to give this disclaimer and what has helped me a lot in Bitcoin as well, like it, the hardest thing I think is challenging your own beliefs, right? Like you end up with a certain conclusion based on rationale and then you're like, oh no, this is like totally against what I thought was true. Mm -hmm. But when you get over that, you know, then I think Bitcoin clicks more on one sense, but you are also incentivized. And I think that's for me, the deeper meaning also of Bitcoin. It's a mutual beneficial technology basically right like it's i am incentivized not because of the number go up i'm incentivized because i am forced to follow not only my intuition but what i know is true and that is what gives me the personal struggle and you see in the old world that people kind of um yeah they 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 don't even start struggling basically right they they just well say i'm cambridge and this is the <laughs> this is the number and who is daniel batten from new zealand on twitter but that is a disingenuous thing it's a, it's a it's a weak frame almost a personal weak frame where these people just stay in the yeah same uh 
same way of working or thinking and not challenging themselves. Like I, yeah, I find that fascinating that their incentive is that, and our incentive is just um, amplifying what we understand is the truth. One of the things that running a technology company teaches you is that to to beat your competition, it's not enough to be better. You have to be 10 times better at what you do mm. because yeah. the the power that comes with the brand of the people you're up against and the marketing engines and the history and the established relationship is so strong that you, you have to be 10x better to get traction. And that's true in knowledge transfer as well. If you want to go up and say, you know, Cambridge is wrong and I'm right – and not just look like you're arrogant, then yeah. you've got to, you, you can't just have a slightly better model. You've got to have a model that's way better, that's mm -hmm. way more robust, that's way more nuanced, that, and that your articulation about why Cambridge is, is wrong has got to be so on point, has got to be expressed in a way which is still respectful because they have yeah. done good work to put that model out there. And it is, uh, has been for a long time the best model, and they were the pioneers, and it was accurate up until two years ago. And what's happened is that since that two years, mining's moved off grid, and their focus has moved off Bitcoin onto Ethereum uh, due to resource constraints. And so there's a whole lot of things you you just got to be good at. And then even then, it's you know it's it's hard. You got your work stack up because of course you're a nobody from the edge of the earth um, saying, look, you should use our model or you should use our software or you should use our technology. It's better. And, and Bitcoin has had this problem as well, where it's, it's very clear to me now that it's, uh, it's sound money and that fiat is not. But to start with, it, it, it looks like an upstart and you have this, an entrenched system which has the brand, which has the trust, which has the reputation, which has the trusted networks, had all these things. So again, yeah. it's yeah. not enough that Bitcoin's better than fiat. It has to be 10 times not even 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times better when you're going to challenge a monetary system. So everything disruptive is always going to be order of magnitude better to get hold, and everything that disrupted will always be attacked by the people who have a vested interest in making sure that they are not displaced. Yeah, this is what uh, Jeff Booth um, describes in a really great post of him. It's, I think it's called The Great Game. And he, he talks exactly about this, right? Because you're fighting a monopoly that is already, uh, you know, intertwined with uh, systems and everyday life and, and, and all these things. So you have to not only be better, but also be able to show <laughs> how, you're, how you're better and also keep continuing doing that, right? Like just being there, like saying, okay, a Bitcoin is inevitable, that is not going to work. Uh, that's also, by the way, what I love about your work, that you're just relentless and you just keep going. So, uh, yeah, uh, I think that's very admirable. What What is like a personal belief that made you not get Bitcoin then when you encountered it? What was what was the, your thing? Uh, it, was, it was interesting. Uh, I made a mistake. Uh, so back in 2000 and... It was actually my wife who got it. Uh, I didn't want to. So I first heard about it in, well, 2014. <laughs> I thought, that's never going to change anything. Um, and even if it does, money's not that meaningful. Money's just money. It's just a method of transacting. Uh, it's not fundamental to how society operates. So I dismissed it. And then I heard about it again in 2016 uh, when a friend of mine, Willie Wu, was talking about it, and he's like, oh, no, you should get some Bitcoin. It's really good. And he'd started to look into it deeply at that stage, and I hadn't. And I was, and he talked to me a little bit about it. I just I, I couldn't get overly excited. I understood why money was broken because I'd gone through that learning to some extent during the global financial crisis, but I thought gold was the solution. Uh, so I didn't see there was a need for another solution other than gold as a store of value. Uh, and then... I said, well, as an investment, I should invest in things which I know and which I'm comfortable about, and that's technology companies. So I'm going to keep on investing in technology companies because I don't know about Bitcoin, and for me to know about it, it's going to take too much time, uh, which is true. It does take time to get to know about Bitcoin, uh, and yep. in order to invest in it, you should take that time. Absolutely. But I just wasn't prepared to invest that time. So... You could say it was a mistake or you could say it just wasn't the right time. But anyway, I, I missed that. 
because of my wife's insistence, we got a small amount uh, at that time and and held that for, for many years. And then it wasn't till about 2020 that, again, another conversation, Willie said, look, I really think you should look at this. And by that stage, I'd missed everything that happened in 2016. So I was like, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe I should learn from that mistake of not listening to you the first time. So let me look at it a little bit more. <laughs> and, and I did. And I thought, okay, this is this has got some legs. This is worth a, a slightly larger allocation. Uh, and then I started to hear all the environmental stories. In about 2021, I started to get quite concerned because I was hearing Elon Musk was pulling out. Uh, and I was hearing that China were banning it because of environmental concerns. And at that stage, I was thinking, ah, I might have to sell my Bitcoin. That was actually what came up in my mind because it already, what had happened in the global financial crisis, I'd bought gold. And then I saw a documentary on gold about how it resulted in cyanide poisoning of indigenous rivers in the Amazon rainforest and uh, all sorts of incredibly toxic things that it does to the environment. And... I just thought I can't hold this asset anymore for environmental reasons. I sold it. And then I was like, oh, man, do I have to go and sell this asset too? Because this asset is also bad for the environment. <laughs> and yeah. and I thought, uh, I kind of saw a, a couple of videos, uh, one by Andreas Antonopoulos, uh, which was saying that it could green the grid. And again, I wasn't convinced because there was no quantification, but it did make me think, okay, he does raise a good point, which is I should look at investigating whether the positive externalities have some merits at some point. I said, I don't have bandwidth for doing that now, but it kind of didn't make me pro Bitcoin, but it said, okay, stay of execution. I won't sell it. And so then I was kind of neutral about it. It's like, okay, it's a, it's a good, good investment. Um, I'm not so sure it's good for the environment. I'm not completely sure it's bad for the environment either, but I'm somewhere in the middle. And then it wasn't really till 2022 that I thought, okay, I, I want to figure this out for myself. And I was just fortunate that I had a whole bunch of time. And I said, well, I'm going to go down the rabbit hole. But it wasn't the sound money rabbit hole. It was the, is it good for the environment rabbit hole, which is a different rabbit hole. But it, it leads you to some places which are very similar in terms of realizing that a lot of institutions you might have trusted. Uh, you realize aren't so trustworthy. Uh, that was one of my conclusions. Mm. Uh, it, it taught me the value of really questioning a lot, doing your own research, finding people who are real subject matter experts, not people who just told other people they were subject matter experts. There were a lot of people talking about Bitcoin who were called energy experts, but they weren't um, because it's not enough to be a so-called energy expert. You need to understand grids. You need to understand demand response. You need to understand methane mitigation. You can know generically about how energy works and know about none of those three things. And even if you know about all of those three things, you've still got to understand Bitcoin mining dynamics. Uh, you've still got to understand um, how different renewable technologies and different fossil fuel technologies interact with them. And so there's a lot of knowledge you're intersecting. So it's more, there's no course you can do in this stuff. It's, it's yeah. a role of, it's as much synthesis of information as it is analysis of information. And if all you can do is an analysis of information, you analyze a single thread. So you might analyze, for example, um, Bitcoin's energy consumption. And then based on that single lane, you'll make some conclusions and the conclusions will all be wrong. Or you might analyze its emissions. Um, but then again, the conclusions will be wrong because you haven't factored in uh, trend lines. You haven't factored in positive externalities. And you haven't factored in questioning the underlying data set. And you haven't truly um, understood you know, the, the complex interplay between Bitcoin and grids or Bitcoin and reducing methane emissions. Yeah. So it's not a simple yeah, it's it's interesting that you mentioned that you realized that not everything you thought was true. It's also like a common theme. Like what, what are some of those things? Like what's the main thing that, that you realized? I, I realized, I knew that you should treat what you read in the newspapers with a grain of salt, but I never realized honestly just how bad it was. Mm. 
I, I had, I was like, it was a real wow moment. The, the degree to which things would get, like I'll give you an example. The, the recent publication, uh, which went in the BBC, which was a, an institution I used to trust a lot, uh, The Independent, New York Times, Verge magazine, Fast Company, a, a, a magazine that I read a lot right? yep. <laughs> for 20 yep. years, had a lot of respect yep. for. Um, all uncritically publishing an academic commentary based on some metrics which were debunked in 2018, interestingly, by Cambridge. Uh, and getting headlines wrong, not understanding the difference between a, 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 um, a Bitcoin transaction and a Bitcoin payment, not understanding yes. that a Bitcoin transaction can contain 10 billion payments. Mm -hmm. uh, so basic emissions in Bitcoin knowledge. And I was like, this is crazy. And there's this strange convention where it's deemed that in order to comment or be a journalist on Bitcoin, you have to hold no Bitcoin, which, which is crazy. Now, as if somehow by holding the asset, it somehow sullies you and makes you ipso facto, yeah. facto self-interested. But then they should you, do that on the other side as well, right? Like, okay, if, if you don't okay, you know own Bitcoin, hold but currency. You, yeah, yeah, you, you know well, that like, bank account. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what, yeah, what are you <laughs> talking about? Yeah, you, you have to use. Um, this, you, yeah. you have to barter. You have to use sticks and um, stones and shells to trade. No, yeah. you, you, so yeah. you are using something. So you need exposure to everything. But how we understand things is we, we understand them by using them. We understand assets by using yes. them. If you prevent yes. your journalists from using the asset they're writing about. You know, it's mm. as if saying, um, okay, um, I'm not going to ever go to a doctor in my life because I understand how the incentives work and I understand when a doctor prescribes me something, he or she will get a cut of that prescription. Okay, so they have an inbuilt financial incentive to prescribe me something, to tell me that I'm sick and not to get me well. Now, okay, it's good to understand the incentive structure. It's good to understand that as a risk. But the conclusion that I should never go to the doctor is dangerous. Uh, and so yeah, I might say, exactly. well, I'm not going to go to a doctor. I'm only going to go to physios because they don't write prescriptions, so I know I can trust them. Um, that would be crazy. Or, or I'm not going to go to a dentist because a dentist has a vested interest in putting um, amalgams into my teeth, which he or she gets paid for. So I'm not going to do that. What I'll do is I'll go to an osteopath because, after all, the tooth is just a bone. So I'll go to an osteopath because yeah. they don't put amalgams in my mouth, and they'll give me a good professional opinion. Clearly, yeah. that would be ludicrous. But we do the same thing when it comes to the so-called energy experts. We don't go to people who understand Bitcoin. We don't go to people who understand Bitcoin mining because they're deemed to have a vested interest. Mm. And so then we go to these people who, who are generalists in the field of energy, don't understand grids deeply, don't un have, have not done deep dives into demand response, have certainly not understood or even used Bitcoin and certainly do not have a good understanding of Bitcoin mining, and we ask them to comment on Bitcoin mining's impact on the environment and on grids, and we expect to get great results. Crazy. So it's led to me to distrust the ways that we make decisions, the, the ways that we validate whether someone has a worth, an opinion we should listen to or not. Uh, it's made me realize and even some of these trusted institutions as well the methodologies it, when i was looking at cambridge's data I, I had to pinch myself again and again i'm like no that is cambridge come on they must be right you must be wrong don't get too big for your boots again the ego kicked in it's like no you must be wrong they must be right they're cambridge but i kept on adding up and i said no something's not matching the, the data is wrong the data is wrong uh, and i was lucky that i had a com community of other uh, people who understood Bitcoin and energy who really supported me. They said, no, 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 look here, at, look, look here at this, look at this data, look at this data point. They said, no, no, keep digging, you're onto something. There is an anomaly here. They haven't considered this. Look at these Bitcoin mining companies. There is a disparity in the renewable energy use. And also look at why people are going off grid in the first place. They're going off grid because they want cheap power. Look at the graph of what's happened to yeah. power over the last 20 years. It used to be cheap power was fossil fuel. Now it's all renewable. So they said, well, doesn't it stand to reason that not because they're greenies, but simply because of economics, that most of these miners who are off-grid, because they've gone for cheap power, that was their number one decision metric, 
most of them should be using, you would expect that would be your hypothesis, right? Renewable or sustainable yeah. energy. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, so there's a lot of questions, a yeah. lot of stuff. Yeah. No, it's so fascinating that, that the thing, like once you see it, you cannot unsee it, right? And it, it, this is just one subject, right? Bitcoin. And as we previously talked about, if you end up at a point where you think this is correct and you know you did all that work and you know you were intellectually honest and you challenged your ego and all these things, and then you just see other people print nonsense, then you know that if it's this subject, <laughs> what's happening with other subjects? That's, right, exactly, what, just that's exactly what happened. Yeah. Correct, correct. Yeah. I said, look, the only yeah. reason that I know that this is nonsense is that I know the subject deeply. This is the only yeah. subject that I know deeply in the world now, exactly. right? Yeah. I don't know any other subjects deeply. This is the only one. This is the only subject I've researched this deeply because you simply don't have bandwidth. But yes, yeah. by extension, you think, wow, there's probably other people like me who've done a lot of research within their expertise who are reading these reports going, what a load of bullshit. Mm -hmm. And but we don't know who they are if we're outside that domain. Just in the same way that most people outside the Bitcoin ecosystem will probably never see this podcast, right? I mean, we'd like to see it, think that a lot of people will. But That'll the be reality, fun. yeah, exactly. that'd, that'd be fun. Yeah. That'd be amazing. But it's it's how do you do that? How do you cross pollinate between one group of you know uh, wacky autistic people and another group who who've been crazy enough to go deep into the weeds and find that knowledge? Yeah. Uh, but they exist everywhere, but we're not interconnected enough. It would be great if somehow we could connect all these people who were crazy enough to go so deep and down the rabbit hole in their particular area, whether it's Bitcoin, whether it's something else, connect them all together because we probably stand quite a good chance of uh, furthering human knowledge if we did so. And it wouldn't yeah. be the universities. who It would be like a peer-to-peer -peer network of autistic people. Yeah. Well, it's actually interesting, and, and, and then we'll move on, but uh... – on Twitter and you too, by the way, there was a there was a thing this last week. We in all these other subjects, I have not seen people who say I will debate anyone, anyone, you know, whatever the subject is, anyone can debate me on what I'm saying about whatever mandates, right, or certain uh, technology or electrification of cars or whatever. In Bitcoin, everyone says it. Everyone says, come debate me. If you hate Bitcoin, come debate me. If you think mm -hmm. it's bad for the environment, come debate me. And no one is showing up, right? And I, that that is also, for me, like a very big signal, right? Like, if you shout from the rooftops, come debate me, I know you're honest. Like, I know you did it, right? Like, it, 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 if you would do they, they it on a big public They probably saw the YouTube video podcast. between Alex DeVries and Lynn Alden. They saw what happens. Yes. When yes. the Bitcoiner is <laughs> given the right of reply, it's brutal. Yeah. That's it, but that's it, right? And I think for people listening who maybe are still on the fence about this Bitcoin interesting or something, like I use this as a signal for myself, right? Where it, it's more like the social behavior you see where it's like, okay, so someone is intellectually honest and the other one is just emotional, right? Well, then you already know who uh, who clearly did more more work and, and it should be a signal for you to also learn more about, you know, whatever the subject is in this case, Bitcoin. Um, I want to ask you two, hopefully short questions. Let's see. But before we jump into the book, I, I just wanted to test now that we are talking like I have a case in my head where I think that for renewable investments, there is a case to be made that you can have more than 100% ROI, right? Like uh, uh, just a simple explainer, like there's a lot of uh, wind, uh, windmill parks in my country. A lot of them are not turning even when the wind blows, right? Because the grid cannot take that electricity. You can argue that if you invested in the hardware and it's not turning, you're losing money, right? So your goal should be to have them turn whenever the wind blows, even when the grid, uh, you know, even when the demand from, from the consumers is not there, right? The only thing you can make that work is when you add Bitcoin miners to that, right? So then you will have 100% ROI on the usage of the hardware. Then you have 100% ROI on the usage or consumption of the energy that's created. And then you have more than 100% return because what you use that energy for, Bitcoin, right? So, so this is, of course, what miners do. You can sell that or hold that to, for it to accrue value. 
I totally don't uh, like, does this make sense to you? And, and second question, I totally don't understand why governments are not doing this. Like it, it, it makes no sense to me. It feels like you're wasting money investing in this hardware and then not utilizing it fully. Governments get voted out when they do things which people believe are bad for the environment. So if enough, and it doesn't even have to be bad for the environment, but if they fear that environmental NGOs will tell them that they're doing something bad for the environment, those environmental NGOs have a lot of lobbying power. Yeah. And so one of the communities that politicians are most scared of is environmental NGOs. And so even if they come to believe that Bitcoin is good for the environment, the fear of being labeled, particularly in Europe, uh, as someone who is doing something which is counter to climate change is, is immense. And so yeah. they'll avoid it because of brand reputational damage. So you've got that to factor with. In, in terms of your question around is it feasible to get that sort of ROI, absolutely it is. And we already know from that Cornell, Cornell University study that using Bitcoin mining in concert with either solar or wind operations will make them more profitable. Yeah, exactly. There is a local Bitcoin mining company that uses Hydro who's been doing some analysis that suggested that it makes them 50% more profitable, which is huge. And that all gets reinvested into, guess what? More solar or more wind. Just like all businesses, they want to reinvest their property, uh, their profits into their business. So that means more yep. wind generation, more solar generation. So not ludicrous at all. And not only is it not ludicrous, but now there's some pretty reputable peer-reviewed research that backs up that this is absolutely possible. And you're going to see that get more and more quantified over the next two years. So we'll be able to look at it and we'll say, if it's a wind farm of this magnitude and you have this much uh, Bitcoin mining, mm. you can expect this much more profitable in these circumstances. It's going to get much more nuanced. So that's quite exciting because not yep. only does that change the narrative, but, but then it becomes harder for politicians to uh, be fearful because as data is your best weapon against FUD. You fight yep. FUD with fact. And so the more yes. fact that comes in, the more the FUD starts to disappear. Yeah, it's amazing how also in this sector, Bitcoin forces transparency, right, to back up whatever your your claim is. So you when you claim that there is a certain incentive, like, you know, I just did, you say we're going to have the data that can actually back that up, right? And yep. there's not a lot of technologies where that is actually done so transparent i'd say so uh, yeah for me that's fascinating that bitcoin yeah forces you to do that like you cannot have empty claims you have to do and show the work basically well again it's because uh, yeah, you have to be 10 terrific. times 100 times better so because yeah. of all the fud and because you're not the incumbent and because everyone's telling it's spoiling the oceans you have to yeah. be so much better at measuring you have to be so much more measurably better you have to be order of magnitude better you, your research has to be better you, you're um, your exception handling has to be better. Your method of articulating it has to be better. Everything has to be better. So the positive about all this FUD is it forces people to be really good at articulating the story of working out the, the most environmentally beneficial outcomes and researching those outcomes and then chasing them as well. So FUD yeah. has actually accelerated the uh, environmental narrative of Bitcoin. Love it. That's great. <laughs> yeah, fun. Um, it, we wouldn't have one, gone, one, look, it yeah. wouldn't have gone as fast if it hadn't been fought so strongly and there hadn't been yeah, so many exactly. false narratives. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, it's amazing. It, it's, it's exactly, I think, what the ethos uh, is of Bitcoin or what Bitcoin stands for. Like, okay, try me and I will show you. Like, I can show you. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I find that beautiful. Um, one other small thing before we go to the book. Are you familiar with the software book from uh, Jason Lowry? I, like I haven't the thesis? read it. I know a little bit about it. I know the core thesis, yes. Uh, okay, yeah. So I, just one thing to share. Like I, I once tweeted to, to Jason. I said, if I understand correctly, you say power projection will always be here. 
right? So countries will fight over resources. They will project their power over each other. And you say, you know, his case is that that will be done through hash wars, computing power wars, right? So whoever has the most computing power and can protect that through Bitcoin, that's his case, right? You can... Um, yeah, keep your power in the world and project your power over others, right? So I tweeted him, okay, so if this is the case and the people who adopt, you know, this hash power are incentivized, as you just mentioned, right, to look for the most sustainable ways or cheapest ways to create this power, basically, are we going to, like, save the world by waging war right is it yeah, going to be yeah. a greener world by saving war right we're accepting that we will always have this war but the other side of that is that we make the planet greener and he said yes and so i wanted to check with you what you think of that yeah i agree it makes total sense because well the only exception to that will be I would see it a little differently. There is one exception, and that is if you're in a country where your cheapest – I think it's more governed by what's the cheapest source of electricity rather than what's the most sustainable. Mm -hmm. It's just by historical accident. Oh, that's that, what I mean. Yeah, you have to invest yeah, in the – Yeah. yeah. We, we are very fortunate that Bitcoin has come at a time in history which has happened to coincide where the cheapest source is renewable. If Bitcoin had come 20 years earlier, it would be a very different story because mm -hmm. the cheapest source would be coal. Um, yeah. So there's there's been some luck here, uncategorically. Now, in most of the world, we're fortunate that the cheapest source will be sustainable. However, there'll be some countries where it's not. In Russia, it's going to be natural gas. Um, in some other parts of the world, it'll be something else. So it's likely that you'll see, I would say, a proliferation of mining in different countries, a proliferation of people trying to secure hash rate, absolutely, at the cheapest cost possible. Um, will that lead everyone to be green? I, I think it'll be more that it'll lead everyone to try and be cheap and to find new ways to utilize stranded and wasted energy. Yeah. And we're just lucky that that happens in most cases to be places like uh, wind farms built in the wrong place or uh, not near a major population center or with a grid that doesn't have the capacity to take all that surplus wind power when you get 92 hours concurrently of um, gale force winds in north germany and all your power gener power users are in south germany and the grid can't take it yeah. or you have some yeah. landfills which um, are just emitting methane freely into the air and you can't utilize that power and you can't connect them to the grid that is where people will compete stranded yeah. energy wasted energy cheap energy energy which no one else can use yeah so it forces the innovation to actually forces harvest innovation. that energy, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. Harvesting of wasted All right. energy. All right. Well, thanks for answering. Like now that I was talking to you, I, I I really wanted to you know hear your thoughts on that. If we move to your book, it's called How to Change the World with One Pitch. You lay out principles of a four-step system that you say anyone can apply to. You know, help help uh, Bitcoiners orange pill, or or at least trigger others to to orange pill themselves. What well, can we walk through the framework? Like, why is it so effective? Where did this uh, come from? It came from my uh, obsession with synthesizing knowledge, and as we we're talking about beforehand, if if you try analysis without synthesis, you're gonna you're gonna miss some key things out, and so. When it comes to expressing ideas, there were a lot of resources and books around about how to create a great message. But then you've also got to deliver that message. No one wants to see a great script delivered by some lousy actors. So you've got to deliver it. Okay, everyone gets that. Okay, it's got to, have, got to be a good message, got to be well delivered. Okay. But then there's another dimension, which is the tactics. Uh, you've got to be tactically smart. If you have the wrong strategy, it's like if you're talking to a community and you don't understand what they care about most, what their values are, you can have a wonderful message, beautifully articulated, and it's off target. It's like trying to hit a target uh, with an arrow when you're blindfolded. And so being tactically smart is the equivalent of taking that blindfold off and knowing your audience to the extent that before you even open your mouth, you understand which are the right arrows to unleash, the arrows of logic, the ar arrows of... Um, points, the arrows of inspirational messages, the arrows of 
understanding an issue and speaking to it in a way which is likely to be heard. So that's the tactical dimension, the third dimension. And the fourth dimension is more important than any of those other three. It's the most subtle, but it's actually the most powerful, and that's the mindset you're in before you open your mouth. And, and this is where a lot of people go wrong on Twitter, and it loops right back beautifully to how we started, which is, okay, you've got wonderful tactics. You've got a great message. You deliver them beautifully. But at the point you come to say it, what you're thinking is, this person is such an idiot. Why don't they get it? I'm then, guilty of that, yeah. No, yeah, <laughs> me too. <laughs> me too. Then nothing you say will land. Mm -hmm. And so, Agree. again, this is where the ego gets in the way and undermines everything else. And it's the most subtle. And so because it's the most subtle, often it's the most neglected. But I, as I say, it's also the most powerful. And we know this. We know this intuitively, as you just said, because you've had that direct experience of when your mindset's off, everything's off, because it affects your message. It affects your delivery. It affects your patience. There's subtle changes in your body language, in your expression, and people can read that because people are mm -hmm. good at reading people. And you get the feeling, this person doesn't care about me. This person just cares about um, expressing their ideas. Uh, yeah, this that's person, their perception yeah. because I cannot recognize – my own ego, right? So they have the wrong yep. perception of me, totally the opposite of what I actually am trying to do. Hopefully help them see what I C see. Correct, correct. So there's this, this process of shedding that ego and saying, well, coming back to, well, what is my intention here? What is my intention? Is my intention that I want to come out of this feeling, oh, that was a good intellectual fight. I, I beat mm -hmm. him, I showed him, I, whatever. Is that my intention? I want to get one over the other person. Okay, that's one intention. Is my intention I want to let off steam? Is my intention that I, I want to freely vent? Is my intention that I want to look intellectually superior in front of my peers on Twitter? Is my intention that I want to uh, indulge a previous habit of exercising no impulse control? So it's about getting honest with yourself. What is my intention mm -hmm. here? Or is my intention that I would like to adopt the stand of speaking to another person the same way I would like to be spoken to? Okay. Well, that's going to require a different sort of communication. So the mere process of asking, what's my intention? And this is something mm. I do repeatedly. Because as I say, um, my predilection for a long time has been to get angry, to get exasperated. Why doesn't this person get it? And... I think particularly the more you know about something, here's the irony, the more you know about something, the bigger the risk that you come across as a dickhead because you, some of that exasperation and that frustration comes across in the way you express, because, and that's where you risk sounding superior, and that's where you risk uh, losing that humility that you realize you don't know everything. The system's constantly changing. Knowledge is changing. You have gaps in your understanding. Someone else might think of something. You might become mm. the, um, the future incumbent, and there's some other disruptor who has some knowledge asymmetry that you didn't have that caused you to suddenly be the person you were criticizing one year ago. So, so that intellectual humility is really important, and that process of remembering, well, if I lose my humanity in the process and if I stop caring about other humans, what have I really gained at the end of the day? Didn't I say I yeah. came to Bitcoin because I believe it was for the people and it could, yes, it's about sound money. And yes, it's about through learning about sound money, you learn about how societies are messed up and you want to improve societies of people. Well, you improve lives of people one person at a time. You, you don't fight your way into peace. You don't um, aggression your, your way into love. And and you don't lose control your way into self-control. So you, you, you develop greater love, greater compassion, and greater self-control by practicing love, compassion, and self-control on a regular basis. Yeah. So reminding yourself of those things makes a huge difference. And so my approach has always been, been I know a lot of people say, well, look, you get 10 times the, 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 uh, the, the engagement on Twitter if you're negative or you're aggressive than if you're respectful. Um, I haven't found that to be the case. If you look at, there's this wonderful example today, okay, evidence points. So Elizabeth Warren, bless her heart, 
lovely tweet she wrote about how Bitcoin is uh, great for money launderers. She's right. Bitcoin is used by money launderers. But again, that's a statistic out of context. It turns out it's actually used way more. Um, the fiat system's used way more. Everyone understands that within the Bitcoin ecosystem. Um, and Pierre Rochard uh, wrote yeah, to that her was amazing. A, a beautiful yeah. tweet. He <laughs> has Elizabeth Warren has 6.3 million followers. Pierre has, I think, 46,000, so less than 1%. And he, he totally ratioed her with mm -hmm. respect. He didn't diss her. Yeah. He didn't say she was an idiot. He just pointed out that a, one of her own colleagues was using fiat for money laundering. And shouldn't she look closer to home? Question mark. Very respectfully. So, look, you absolutely can, uh, with respect, with dignity, uh, without putting the other person down, without calling them an idiot, uh, I think you win more people over in the long term. It may feel better in the short term. It may give the ego more satisfaction in the short term. You may feel like, oh, I showed them. Uh, but it's not going to win the respect of the masses, I don't believe. And it's also, more importantly, it's not going to orange pill anyone. How many people yeah. have changed your minds when their mindset was one of frustration, when when you got this vibe that they thought you were an idiot, yeah. uh, when you felt that they felt they knew more than you and you were going to show them or that you were going to dominate them or that you were going to, uh, your superior intellect or knowledge was going to win the day and your mission was just to fill in the gaps in, in their understanding. So all, it doesn't work, does it? And mm, when someone comes with that approach, you can tell. So all that has to be put, whether it's true or not, has to be put to one side and getting back to these human basics of we're two humans, we're in a room, we're forming a connection. Let me understand how you see the world. Let me understand how I can serve you, how I can help you in some way, and maybe I can't. And I have to be prepared for the eventuality. You might not be interested in what I have to say, and that's fine, in which case I'll walk away. I won't yeah. waste my time on yours. Yeah. yeah so I those are, the, those are yeah. the four components. So message, yeah. tactics, delivery, and mindset. But mindset is Amazing. most important. Yeah, I. It's a bit confrontational for me. I love. I love this. It's. It's interesting that. It's like a double um, challenge, right? Because oh, you yeah. know, you also feel that she. I, I will honestly say what I replied. I said I replied, "Bad losers." <laughs> so that I was appreciate my ego. your honesty. Yeah, and look here's the ego. thing. This is not about being a yeah. saint. This this is this is about um, and this is an inconvenient vi uh, video to watch if you if you don't want to um, if you want to if you enjoy so much um, just venting or letting off or whatever and you don't want to challenge yourself. And the mm -hmm. unfortunate thing about watching this is you will challenge yourself and saying, "Am I really being faithful to my intentions? Am I? What is my intention?" But but I believe that's a positive thing because. No, One of the 100%. most powerful questions we can ask us is what do I care about most? What are my values? What am I here to do? You, you know, yeah. you've done out of all the crazy things you could have done in the world, you've cho chosen to do what you do to, to do this podcast. And you've done that for some reasons that you care about the thing called Bitcoin really deeply. You care about a particular community and you want to bring knowledge to that community you don't think were being served as well as they could have been without your presence, not through ego, but just because it was true. And so you create yes. that gap for them. And so it's out of service. And then from time to time, and I'm the same, I do a lot of things. So I want to serve a community that I don't think would be served as well if it wasn't for me, not for ego, but simply because I see a gap and I want to fill that gap. Yeah, it's honestly altruistic, right? It's, like, it's honestly it's, altruistic, yeah. exactly. And now just because we have that altruism, it doesn't mean that altruism reflects through in every single atomic action we take, right? We, we, we're yeah. going to be on a spectrum depending on whether it's a good day or a bad day. However, if we ask ourselves that question, you know, what am I here to do? What, why am I doing it? Why did I mm -hmm. choose this path? Does this communication express that intention? <laughs> yeah. Just asking that question is enough to go, yes. eh, maybe I'll say this yeah. rather than that. That's yeah. all we need. Yeah. That's all we need. Yeah, 100%, man. I, I thank you for showing me this or just helping me think about this again. Like, I, I know how it works. Um, it's more like, you know, with Elizabeth Warren, it's just, I'm so disappointed. I you get know, it. It's, 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 I get it. I'm so like, oh my God, like, are there people, are there really people like this out there, right? Like, it's, it's that frustration that I think, like, yeah. 
oh we have a long way to go and this is only like yeah. one subject like oh my yeah. god you know like that is yeah. the, that that frustration is what makes me tweet bad loser <laughs> i totally get but, it and, and you know and it's nice because then yeah. i feel lighter after afterwards right but, but you're totally agree like it's not a long-term thing and and i love that you that you connected that with this podcast 100 percent. my whole goal with the podcast is i start this i want to help my generation yeah. yeah i don't care uh, if i make money or whatever i have one goal my first goal one goal is make 100 episodes and and i'll see what happens that's the whole mm -hmm. that's the thing and nothing more than that right and so i love that you connected that because that's true that's that's how i, I want to shine the light on, something, there, but then, on, on someone in yeah. particular that really is is a great example of this and and i would say does this better than i do uh and that's lynn alden and mm -hmm. a lot of the people i talk to about lynn alden they respect two things about her one is her deep knowledge of incredibly deep knowledge of her content and her incisive intellect and ability to speak about it cohesively and concisely. And secondly, is the way that she communicates that information. So there's what she says and there's she's how she says it. Mm. And both are yeah. equally important. And, and the reason that she was able to do what she did with Alex DeVries is if you watch that video, not once does she attack him. Not once does she say, you know, your statistic about this is wrong. She doesn't take that tack at all. She doesn't even talk about, um, get into a, a debate with him. She just looks at the abstract points and then adds a more nuanced understanding than what he brings to the picture. Yes. And it's brutal. It's brutally effective because she doesn't get into a fight. She doesn't get into a debate. She furthers the conversation and she adds the missing nuance with respect for the other person. And the the turnaround was absolutely phenomenal. And I I, I think about that often because I th here's the thing. I, I know a lot of the the ways that Alex DeVries is using data. There are statistics that have been debunked and there's things that are inaccurate, et cetera. But I was, I was ever in a conversation, uh, that would not be the right go-to. Because then you just look like two politicians agreeing point, disagreeing point by point. Yeah, then you actually step into his frame of correct, uh, correct. how he's working. Yeah. You cannot win a game from your side of halfway. Uh, yeah. And that's the thing that a lot of the response of the Bitcoin community has been very defensive. And yes, there's, there are some things that need to be defended, and that's important, but that's only half the equation. And that's why it's a part of when I discovered that Bitcoin was had the potential to be a tremendous net positive for the environment, I said, well, yes, there's some work to be done to defend false claims. There's also some work to be done, and this is much more fun, to tell the inspiring story that hasn't yet been told. So, yes, yes there's, there's what you say and there's how you say it. And we have these examples. And, and I say that because I believe Lynn Alden has as much impact because of who she is as a person and the standard that she helps us to rise up to become as the education that she gives. And, and we all, as leaders within the ecosystem, have that same capability where there's the knowledge we impart and the education we give and the points we make, and then there's who we're being, who we are. Mm, yes. and, and that's as important, I would say even more important, because that has a, an even longer lasting legacy. Man, I love that we talked about this. This taught me a lot, actually. Like, I'm really thinking, okay, like, I, I know I am thinking about tweets that I think uh, where I tweeted more angrily, I'd say. And my new, I, I think my new outset is I'm going to, before I tweet that, I'm going to see, can I turn this around <laughs> into a positive thing? Because I absolutely, absolutely agree. Yeah, it's so, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. Like, I, I'm fascinated by the personal journey and challenge of understanding Bitcoin, which is exactly this you know mm. one of the, the greatest moments of last year was i shared the story uh and a tweet about a week ago was a guy who wrote an article about seven technologies that were green in the bitcoin and these articles come up like every two months someone will write mm -hmm. one of them and uh, you know the first reaction is oh here we go again and the second reaction is do i do i really have to be the guy who keeps on doing this again and again i'm sick of the, <laughs> yes. i'm sick of having to do all these take this why do i have to debunk all these articles right i'd rather not be doing that there's things i'd much rather be doing than debunking these articles 
Um, but I put that to one side. I put my frustration to one side and I asked myself the question, okay, how would I like to be communicated to if I'd written that article? And that caused me to write in a very different way. Now, I still challenged mm. the article because that, that article needed to be challenged because it contained some things which were incorrect. But the way that I did it, the mindset I was in when I did it was completely different. And as a result of that, that opened up the possibility. And here's the thing. It's not a probability. It's a possibility. You can't control what the other person does. You can be as respectful as you want. The other person can still um, be disrespectful back. But you increase mm -hmm. the probability of reciprocation when you, from your side, communicate the way you want to be communicated to. And he wrote back and said, actually, uh, you raised some interesting points there, but what about this and this and this? And I'm like, ha ha, okay, now we're in a dialogue, not a debate. I'm going to continue this. So I just yeah. said, oh, that, that's an interesting point. Yes, you're right here. What about this? And then this and this and this. And he was like, oh, actually, I hadn't thought about this. Within about two or three exchanges, he was like, actually, this looks really good. And then <laughs> I could not believe it. A week later, he wrote an article about the positive environmental benefits of Bitcoin. And I was like, hallelujah. That wasn't yeah. the outcome I was expecting. That wasn't the reason I did it. But I also reflect, and that says more about him than it does about me and about his virtues, because I know that not everyone responds that way. But also it was partly because of the mindset I was in. And I know that had I followed my first impulse, it would have been impossible exactly, for him to yeah. respond that way. Yeah. But this is also a great illustration of, you know, as I said, bad loser, and I felt uh, my ego was happy that I did that, right? That's a very small reward. Very yeah. Un, you well, know, you know with Elizabeth Warren, the game is not to get her to change your mind. That's not the game. The game is no, an internal no, exactly. game. It's an internal yeah. game about, you know, totally can, right. I, can I, uh, when it comes to, again, we become, as Aristotle said, what we habitually do. So there will mm. come a time when you're talking to someone who's not an Elizabeth Warren, who does have the capacity to change their mind. And if you've been in the, in the habit of communicating in the way that would encourage someone to do so, you'll be practiced. It won't be a new thing you've suddenly got to do. It'll be part of who you are. So it'll, it'll appear yeah. genuine rather than disingenuous. Yeah, no, exactly. So, so what I wanted to say is like you illustrate that if you don't take the short little um, reward route, the adrenaline you take the hit. longer route, yeah. you take the bit longer route, which is maybe draining or challenging. It's but hard the reward start, is also a bit, The reward it, is it, so it's, much bigger. It, yeah, and longer because it motivates you to keep continuing this. But also, you influenced someone else to challenge their, themselves, and yeah. then even create some output that is a 180 from you know a one four weeks before. And so, I think that's that 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 should be emphasized more. I love I love that. I think mm -hmm. that's the mechanic how it works, right? Like the fact that you well, can accept that you have to struggle, yeah, before you can reap the rewards, right? That is a universal thing in in. Um, in general, Correct. right, for your personal development. Yeah, love that. Correct. Um, yeah, to wrap it up, I uh, I asked the same question to everyone, and that's what is a core belief that you will never let go? Oh, man, you end with a big one. <laughs> I believe that love will change the world. Amazing. That's a great end. Thanks so much for this conversation. I really enjoyed it. And um, yeah, I, I will link to all the places where people can find you, your book, obviously, and uh, your writings on badcoins.com. I love that. Name. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for coming on, man. Uh, I hope to do this again uh, somewhere in the future. Thank you, Bram. It's been a pleasure. Cheers. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, it would be amazing if you could rate, review, and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. It will help us educate more millennials on the importance of Bitcoin. You can follow and connect with me on Twitter. I'm Bramke, that's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on Bitcoin that's worth sharing, hit me up. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.